Good morning and welcome to St Ninian's Parish Church here in Christophan in Edinburgh. My name is James Aitken and I'm the minister here at St Ninian's. It's lovely to welcome you to worship this morning online. We're also worshiping in the sanctuary, 10.30 in the church. Uh, so please join us there if you feel able to do so. Uh, this morning we continue with our celebration of Epiphany, the manifestation of Jesus Christ in the world, of God in Jesus Christ in the world. And we listen to the story of God manifest in Jesus Christ on a boat, boat on the Sea of Galilee as Jesus worked with fishermen there. Thanks to this video there are intimations and an order of service, so please have a look at them when you get the opportunity. At all of St Ninian's services, we welcome each other with words of peace. If there's someone with you just now, please turn to them. If not, maybe phone a friend after the service and say, peace be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord with, with the, let us give thanks to the Lord with our whole heart. Before God, let us sing His praises. We sing hymn number 111, "Holy, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty." Come before God, who in Jesus Christ calls us to imagine what we might become and to lay down all that holds us back and to follow him. Let us pray. Gracious God, in Jesus Christ you were alive on earth and you were manifest among us. You drew close to us and you showed us how much you value our lives by living as one of us. God of holiness, your spiritual energy, your Holy Spirit calls us to follow you and to live as you lived, holy, righteous lives. By so doing, we are transformed so that what we were and what we are are not what we might become. 
your spirit of holiness encourages us to imagine ourselves living lives free of all that holds us back in a society free of all that is not worthy of you. Heal us <coughs> this morning, we pray, to hear your voice calling to us to follow you and so to leave behind all that we do say and think that damages our lives and the lives of others. We are sorry when we fail, when we fall into bad habits that stop our life from flourishing and our apathy means we languish in them uninterested in the better versions of ourselves that might be following you we might become. We are sorry when we are more concerned for the past than hopeful about the future. We are sorry when we are more eager to condemn past wrongs than enthusiastic about encouraging better behaviour in ourselves and in others. Heavenly Father, be with us in every experience of life. When we neglect you, remind us of your presence. When we are frightened, give us courage. When we are tempted, give us power to resist. When we are anxious and worried, give us peace. When we are weary in service, give us energy and zeal for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. First reading is from the Gospel of Luke at chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Genesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signalled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The second reading is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, and the first eight verses. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. 
The pivots of the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. May your people, illuminated by your word, shine with radiance of his glory, (coughs) that his love may be known in the world, as he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. William Wallace. Robert the Bruce, Mary Queen of Scots, James the Sixth of Scotland and the First of England, the Wars of Independence in the 15th century, St Columba, John Knox, the Reformation, the massacres of Glencoe. These are all just some of the names and events associated with Scottish history. Like all history anywhere, Scottish history can sound like it is all about kings and queens and important people and wars. History is most often told about people and events that are exceptional because those events and people are what are remembered or written about very rarely is history written about ordinary people living ordinary lives. Because nobody thinks we will be interested in ordinary people living ordinary lives. And why should normal people be remembered? Ask yourself, will your name and your life go down in history? Maybe not. And that's a shame because Our lives, you and I, and people like us, make up the vast majority of Scottish life. That's not just true of Scotland, but of most history. For example, what was it like to live in the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago? It's easy to discover what it was like to be, for example, an emperor, but what was it like to be an average person like you or me living 2,000 years ago? What was his or her life like? That's harder to discover. 
The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are important religious texts for Christians, of course, but they're also interesting to anyone who wants to know a little bit about history and what life was like for the average person living in a small corner of the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago. The Gospels are very short books, but they are so good at telling us what life was like back then because Jesus, the subject of those books, was so good at encountering normal people. In our story this morning, he becomes a fisherman And so we learn how difficult it was for fishermen to earn a living. In other stories, Jesus is a shepherd, and so we learn about the job of a shepherd in first century Palestine. Elsewhere, Jesus describes himself as a vintner, pruning and tending vines of grapes. So we know that wine was part of everyone's life. Jesus sat formally at a table for a meal with tax collectors and we learn about the life of your average hated tax collector. Jesus was a preacher in a synagogue and so we learn something about religious belief in first century Palestine. He became a lawyer to talk about to, to, to talk to other lawyers about the legality of accepting help from a Samaritan. So we learn a little bit about lawyers back then and how Jewish law affected ordinary people 2,000 years ago. Jesus talked with experience about farming and farmers sowing seed on the ground. And so we learn how hard that life was with all the different types of soil that the seed might fall on. Jesus was a guest at a wedding and we discover how ordinary people celebrated in first century Palestine. Jesus was a doctor healing people, and we learn about illness back then, especially psychological illness. What's more, Jesus was also a king. He was the king of the Jews when he stood before Pilate, and so we learn a little bit about the fate of ordinary people's lives being decided arbitrarily by kings and other rulers in the first century Roman Empire. Read the Gospels and you can construct a pretty good picture of who lived in that corner of the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago, how they lived and what they struggled with, how and when they celebrated and what their relationships were like with each other and with those who ruled over them. That should encourage us. It may be that when the history of the 20th and 21st centuries are written, our names won't be mentioned by historians. We may know that our biographies won't be written, but nevertheless, that doesn't mean that who we are, who we were, and what we did are of no importance. Our lives have value because we believe that God was in Jesus Christ and it was with people like us that Jesus Christ encountered, ate and drank with, celebrated with, healed and helped. When the history of this year is written, historians might write about the prime ministers and presidents who ruled But in God's book of life, it is people like you and me who are mentioned. God knows who you are and God values who you are. Why? Why might that be? Why is it that God is more interested in what you do and in who you are than in what the great and the good, the wealthy and the powerful, the eye-catching and the charismatic do and who they are in history? Well, the truth, of course, is that the Gospels aren't history. We might be able to glean from them a lot about the past, about ordinary life a long time ago, about who lived then and how they lived, but that is not their purpose. Their purpose is not to record the past in a history lesson, which is why 
It is not really interested, they are not really interested in the great and the good, the wealthy and the powerful, the kings and emperors who made history a long time ago. The Gospels are less interested in history and more interested in the future. God in Jesus Christ is less concerned with what has happened and more concerned with what will happen. God in Jesus Christ is less concerned with who you were, no matter who you were, and more concerned with who you might become. It was not the case that God in Jesus Christ drew close to people and their ordinary lives in order to simply value who they were and what they did. He drew close to them to encourage them to believe in who they might become. God wants to transform us. Transformation for God is salvation. <clears throat> if you follow me, <clears throat> if you follow me, Jesus said to the fishermen, I will make you fishers of people. That is to say, just as you have plucked fish from the waters of chaos, from the deep sea, so in your life, I will teach you how to pluck people out of chaos and the stormy seas of life. To the shepherds, he said, follow me and you will become people who love and care for those I love and care for. To the congregation in the synagogue, he asked them to follow them and thereby to become people who fulfill the teaching of the Bible and its specific concern for those who suffered poverty and destitution. In the vineyards, he called on people to follow him and become new wine, to live new lives, pruned of all that holds them back from living life in all its fullness. At the formal dining table, eating with tax collectors, he said, follow me, and as I have invited you, you will become people who will invite others to the banquet of the kingdom of God. To the guests at the wedding, he said, follow me, and you will become as close to God as a bridegroom to a bride, as a bride to a bridegroom. To the lawyers, he said, follow me, and as I have understood your laws in a moral context, so you will fulfill the law with mercy as with justice. To the sick, he said, follow me, and you will learn that your illness has nothing to do with sin, and as you have been healed by forgiveness, so you will be able to forgive others. Follow me, he said to Pontius Pilate, and you will discover that being a king is about serving people, not oppressing them. The question that the Gospels ask, that the question that the gospel ask, Gospels ask us is not, who are you? God knows who you are. The question is, who might you become? The story that God wants to tell about you is not about what you have done, but about what you might do. Whereas God in Jesus Christ values you and loves you dearly, no matter who you are, what interests God is what you might do and be in the future. Don't be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The question of who we might become has been a question that the Church of Scotland as a whole has avoided. For too many years, the Church has confront comforted itself in the knowledge that God loves his people, values his people and draws close to them. For too many years, the church has enjoyed the company of Jesus Christ sitting in its boat on the lake, receiving encouragement and guidance on how to fish and where the bountiful shores are. For too many years, the church has heard Jesus say, do not be afraid, but has closed its ears when Jesus has said, 
from now on. And the church has rarely left its history behind in order to follow him. That is changing. Or at least there is a plan for the Church of Scotland as a whole and for the church regionally here in Edinburgh and the church locally here in Christophan to acknowledge that God loves what we have done and who we are, but also to recognise that God in Jesus Christ also asks us to think about what we will become from now on. For historians like us who know the value of the past, who cherish it, remember it, nurture it and celebrate it, the words from now on are not always easy to hear, but they are being spoken not just by Jesus, but also by the Presbytery, which has published a plan for the future of the Church of Scotland in this part of Scotland. That includes a plan for the Church of Scotland in this part of Edinburgh. The plan at the moment is just a consultation and is somewhat sketchy in outline and nothing is set in stone. Kirk Session of St Ninians will be discussing it this coming week and in that discussion it will be important to look for the ways the Presbytery has recognised who we are, what we have done and where we have been, to what extent we are known already by God. But equally important are the words from now on. And equally important is the question, who might we become? In our lives, there is not always a straightforward answer to that question. Younger people probably find it easier to answer it than older people do. For the young, there is less to leave behind and more to look forward to. But in God's world, the question of who we might become is always being asked. It is never too late to follow Jesus. I was captivated by a poem that I read this week by Hannah Lowe from her collection that won a major poetry prize. It's called Balloons. And like her poems in the collection, it is about her experience as a teacher of a sixth form English class and the children she met in that class. Balloons. These five-year-olds remind me of the balloons we had one summer, heart-shaped helium in rainbow colours. We pushed notes inside them and let them go, believing that the moon might catch those small hearts climbing up in the sky. I watched these children knelt around their teacher, their small hands shooting high to give an answer, any answer just the chance to try. But the kids I taught, who came to me at the edge of childhood, was it really then too late? In the common room we said it only took one class, one hour to know the grades they'd get, as though they were a magic eight ball wedged at one conclusion, no matter how hard you shook. Is it already too late for children when they leave school to imagine not what they are, but what they might become? Is it too late for any of us to begin imagining what we might become? Is it too late for the church to imagine what it might become? Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, said Peter to Jesus, convinced that his past, his history, who he was, was all he was, was all that defined him, convinced that he could never be anything more than he currently was. But God in Jesus Christ said to Peter, in the same way as he calls us all to follow him and to become something new, do not be afraid, from now on you will be catching people. Follow me. Now to the one who can keep you from falling and set you in the presence of his glory, jubilant and above reproach, to the only God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, power and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all time, now and forevermore. Amen.
We sing number, hymn number 532, Lord, you have come to the seashore. At this point in the service, we worship in offering something of what we have back to God through the church. St Ninian's, like all churches of Scotland, is a self-financing charity, and if you wish to contribute to the work of the church, you can do so by following one of the links below, or you can contact me or St Ninian's treasurer. Details are in the intimations. Remembering all that the church receives, whether on a Sunday morning or electronically or in any other way, we acknowledge that we give in thankfulness, with gratitude and joy, with prayerfulness, we give in sacrifice and love, with a spirit of hopefulness, we give in commitment to God in the person of Jesus Christ our Lord. We sing our blessing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let us bring before God our prayers for those in need here and across the world, and our grateful thanksgiving for our blessings. Generous God, too often we take our blessings for granted, although there are many of them that come our way unlooked for and with much fortune. Thank you for the love that surrounds us, the kindness of strangers, 
the dedication to duty of those who serve in our society, the encouragement and support we receive from family and friends. We are grateful too for the material well-being we enjoy and the benefits that it brings, the freedoms, the justice, the prosperity and the health and security that surround our lives. Help us, we pray, to be grateful people and to recognise the generosity of others. Around the world, Lord, although human beings can and often do live lives in the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, there is much that is painful, tragic and undeserved. We pray for transformation in the world, that people might imagine what it could become if set free from the chains of history. We pray for a transformation in attitudes towards climate change, that those with the power to do so will do what it is possible to do to make our world safer and healthier for everyone to live in. We remember those who suffer today from a natural world that can wreck destruction as easily as it can blossom in beauty. We remember all those who are plunged into poverty when lives and livelihoods are destroyed by the changing climate. Where people suffer under oppressive regimes and who are not free to decide who governs them or how they worship or how they might live their lives, we pray for a transformation in attitudes to justice. We remember the people of Afghanistan today, whose lives are destitute and who are at the mercy of powers in their own country and around the world, far beyond their control. We pray for those people across the world and those here at home whose daily living is a struggle with ill health, we pray that their lives will be transformed by love and friendship, caring and compassion, and that they may receive your transformational peace in their lives. We remember in particular today all those who are ill or who continue to struggle with the consequences of this pandemic. We pray for those people across the world and those here at home who feel lost, bereft of hope, that life is a crushing burden rather than a joy of a pleasure. May your spirit of holiness lift their spirits and may your light spark a flame in their dark tunnel of sadness. We remember also in particular today all those who continue to struggle with the burden and loneliness of bereavement. In this time of silence, we pray for those whom we know personally who are in need of your love today, Lord, and who are in need of our caring and help. We bring them before you in our hearts now. Eternal God, we give thanks to you for the great community of faith into which you have brought us, for those who have kept safe our scriptures, gathered our songs, built our sanctuaries, and taught us to know and trust you. Grant us grace in our day to live as faithfully as they did, and to provide as generously for our children, until you bring us with all your people into the fullness of your eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. People of God, go out into the world to follow Jesus Christ in your lives and in your living, and to imagine a future that is free of the burden of the past and transformed with love, justice and mercy. We sing hymn 247, moved by the gospel, let us move.
The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you all. Amen.